That was one of my first concerts. Johnny Cash? Johnny Cash. What? Yeah. That's I awesome. I saw him in 1996 or 7. Uh, in uh, Sunset Boulevard at the House of Blues. I was front row. Dude. Saw him, Chris Christopherson, June Carter. What year? Uh, 1997. Wow. I think I was 20 years old. I'm um, jealous. Yeah, it was, I saw him twice. But I, but for somebody my age to be into him, was I was definitely the youngest person there. <laughs> <laughs> I had to like go into House of Blues, have lunch there, because they, they lock the doors and you can't get in if you're 21. And so mm. I sat in the bathroom for an hour and a half. No kidding. <laughs> wow. And then, <laughs> and then walked out. I'm like, hey, I'm here. I'm here for the show. Welcome to Aggressive Life. A few weeks back, you got to meet Bo. Bo knows AI. Most of the rest of us do not. So Bo's back in the Aggressive Life for a Q&A episode all about your artificial intelligence questions and what it means to our life going forward. In case you missed the original discussion, you have no idea that this is a nickname. A good friend of mine, very good friend of mine, I've spent... It's um, been a long time together. <laughs> a long time, like uh, breakfast every week for how many years? I think it was almost 12 years. 12 years. Jeez. So I, I had Bo on last time. It was it was really great discussion, and I'm going to assume you've listened to it. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it, because I'm not going to talk again about why I call him Bo. I'm not gonna, we're not going to talk again about AI. We're going to kind of build from there. So go back there and check that episode out before you get any further in this one. His real name is Chad Reynolds to the rest of the world. He's the founder and CEO of Verve, a... Did I say it right this time? It, we're, yeah, it's Verve improving every Verve. time. Yeah, Verve. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've since we've talked, we've moved to France. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> a people-powered AI company. He's a leading voice and mind on AI. He's been invited to roundtables of places like Google and helped Fortune 500 companies figure out how to leverage AI to hear from consumers and make better products. He is. At the tip of the spear when it comes to AI, he's a very busy man, but he's taking the next hour or so to answer questions that you submitted about artificial intelligence, all collected on Instagram. He hasn't seen these questions, and neither have I. Dirt says some of these questions I can answer. I don't know about that. Dirt's collected all of them, and he's going to toss them out for us to volley back and forth. So enough blabber. Let's have it. Dirt, you, you sure you have this? Like, I'm I'm now putting you in the episode host role. You think you've graduated this level yet? I, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it my shot. Yeah. Heck yeah! Well, you already succeeded with a new microphone, so that's right. You yeah, chuck it up. We're you. vastly improving. We yeah. are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first first question, uh, John Connor from Terminator. How does he feel about AI? Are we are we stepping too close to the edge? Someone mm. literally asked that. Yeah. Uh, why are you pointing me in? I don't know. That's Maybe. Very, for those of us who don't remember, that was, I, I remember seeing Terminator. I didn't know what I was walking into. I just went to a movie. Mind blowing. I probably saw it before you were born. When was Terminator around, oh, around first? Like early 90s? Yeah, it was mind blowing. I was born. You were born? I would hope so. Was if I went to Johnny 90s? Cash like a few years later. So. Yeah. I think. Um, I don't know. I don't even know how to spam spawn the question. I'll let you. I don't even really remember the movie. Terminator was 1984. Okay. All right. It was way off. Yeah. <laughs> See, Bo, you haven't been around as long as I have. That's true. You, you, do you want me to give you the recap of the movie? You, yeah. You, okay. Yeah. So the recap of the movie is John Connor comes back in time because his boss has sent him back in time to protect the future hopes of the human race. Because now, as we would call them AI, the yep. AI computer generated robots and power infrastructure has taken over the world, and real actual human beings are being stamped out. And then the twist is we find as John Connor comes back, he ends up protecting his future boss. Mm. <laughs> who sent him back got because it, it, now it. they're going back to kill him, so there's no resistance. All right. So, so Matt, I think that's kind of the thing, right? I mean, the AI, we can debate how we're going to use it for language and stuff, but is this a real danger? I think the question is, is this a real danger right. to the future yeah. of humanity? That's right. Um, I think any new technology is, you know, there's dangers in it, 
but uh, I think we have to look at the overall intent of what people are trying to do with it first. Um, so I know robotics has been a thing for many decades of just trying to automate kind of human horsepower to go do all you know accomplish all different kinds of tasks in a more efficient efficient way, way that doesn't take six days or you know have feelings. Um, so I think like that's been developing for a long time. Uh, we're now starting to give them more personality. Um, we're giving them not necessarily feelings, but maybe uh, giving them ways to communicate things to us that we would take as it having feelings. So yeah, I mean, there's a ton of danger in kind of where this could go. But after, I think with all of it, it just resides in like who who has the power to do these things and then what is your intent? So there's a ton of dangers in it. Um, it's up to the individual of like what they're going to do with it. Yeah, but the premise of the movie and also movies like was Ex Machina, I think that you turned yeah. me on to, yeah. wasn't what we're going to do with it, that someday the computers actually take over and they do what they want to do with themselves. Right, yeah. That's that's not a danger, you don't think? Um, I'd say it's a danger, but not like a high, not like a high likelihood, because I think we're always going to build kill switches into into a lot of these things. But these could be, you know, decades away. So, um, I think there's just an it, it's just an evolving relationship between how humans and AI not necessarily are going to coexist. It's more of how we're going to use them you know, to advance what we're capable of. Is there a point in time where they get married together or there are, you know, full robots that are using, you know, AI in some way to operate? Yeah, that's already happening. Um, and you don't think it's possible for AI to circumvent the kill switch that humans put on it? I don't think so. Hmm. Well, that's, that's positive and encouraging. <laughs> it's, it's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Derek, give us another one. <laughs> All right. Uh, Okay, well, hold on. I want to dig in that. So, yeah. do you think sentient AI is a possibility in decades? We're not talking about like science fiction in three hundred years. We're talking about like in our lifetime. I, I guess, like, if you call it sentient, as it has feelings, I think that we're far away from that. I think, as far as you feeling like it's sentient, we're already there. Hmm. So, I think they're just two different things. Um, whenever t- people talk about sentient, usually what they mean is. How close are we to an AI feeling like a human? And I think we're part part of the way there. We're, we've now have the mechanics to do it. We've got the brain. We've got like conversations. We've got audio. We've got you know we're starting to build kind of like images, you know, imagery around the AI. Um, you know, we're starting to train it on different types of data sets, which you know up till now it's primarily been on the internet, but. I think we're not we're not super far away from it having what we might be calling sentient uh, types of behaviors. Hmm. Okay, when you think about major changes in world history, we're talking about like the personal automobile, the printing press, the internet. Is AI one of those? And like, where do you think it falls in that span of like this is a complete game changer? Uh, I'd say we're in the complete game changer category right now with with it i think we're approaching some things that are like the uncanny valley um you know you are you you were originally blown away by what ai could do maybe like a year and a half two years ago as more and more use cases are coming out i think you're going into some like kind of impossible things or things that like you didn't think were possible now they somewhat feel commonplace like talking to people that aren't necessarily there like that we're getting normalized to some of that behavior. I think that, you know, we're just at the beginning, like we're in inning one or two Hmm. of a game. I think we're just scratching the surface of what, what this can do for us. So it seems like you're talking on both sides of your mouth. Yeah. You say this is, as the highest level of revolution in terms of innovation that's happened. I mean, you're, you're comparing it with, Internet or going beyond internet, the automobile, all that, which changed modern history. Right. Yet at the same time, you're saying, you said that we shouldn't be afraid of this thing. I don't think we should be afraid of it. Just like uh, in 2000, you know, I was working in, you know, working in San Francisco on a bunch of like dot com startups, websites, all these kinds of things. And you, you knew back then that like, okay, the internet is something special. It's changing how 
I'm behaving. So instead of going to a store, I can now go online. I can start to buy things that maybe I'd never even thought about buying. I can talk with people uh, you know, through like social networks and get connected to people in a completely different way. So you knew back then that the internet is transformational, but it took 20 so years to play out of how is that like ultimately going to change how we buy things? How's it going to change how we interact with one another? How's it going to change commerce and economies? It's going to take a long way to go. You, could you say that the internet is dangerous? Sure. You could say it's dangerous, but it, the ultimately the applications of the internet, I think we're net positive. Yeah. So we're, we're in the first few years of quote unquote, like the internet where you see some really interesting things come out. And now the next decade is going to be all about how creators take that technology and apply it through all these different use cases. So I don't feel like inherently um, my starting point is from a place of danger. Just like with the internet, it was more of excitement. And what? how can I change my life about that? Yeah, that makes sense. What the more fearful-oriented person would say, and I think justly say, if we knew what the internet was going to become, we would have started it differently. We would have put different governors in at the beginning. We would have we would have not had it completely ad supported. We would have, you know, pay a penny a click or something like that. We would have had some other things in that would would have served all of all of culture because we didn't see it coming. Well this one we see coming. So what are we going to do right now to make sure that it doesn't get away from us? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some bills that have been circulated through legislation. There's one in California, um, SB 1074, that's starting starting to introduce some of the um, guardrails around how AI companies should operate. Where should they get their training data? Um, what kinds of features should you know they put into or report to governments um, around the data they have and how they're operating? So those things are starting to happen, and they are st- they are happening a lot sooner uh, than it did within the internet. Hmm. Um, there was still lots of legislation around the internet back in the day, and continues with like FCC regulating you know, who's liable. Like if you post something um, that's you know derogatory to me. Can I sue you for libel or for damages? It, it, or if you post something that isn't true, but then it's seen by others on Facebook, who is liable for 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 those things? So I think those are still being still being hashed out. I think what we have is that governments have have stood up very quickly within AI and recognize that this is a very powerful technology, and they are already working on uh, passing things both in the U.S. and then you know the EU has already passed some legisla- legislation around that. Um, so I think we've uh, reacted quickly compared to what the internet is. Okay, great. Uh, Brian, this one's for you. How do you think God feels about AI? I think, I think God likes it. I think that God has created human beings in his image. We're the only ones who can create. We're the only ones who can innovate. Beavers don't innovate. They do the same structure again and again and again. Same with birds. Birds don't innovate and figure out how to be in a submarine going underneath the water. I think it's in our DNA and in our spiritual makeup to create. And I think that we have responsibility to create. We have responsibility to innovate. So I look at this as one of the beautiful things that makes us humans. And I think that uh, God would applaud us trying to push things forward. He would also applaud us figuring out how to make this as unharmful as possible, like he would with guns. You know, that's why that's how I feel about it. Great. So on this on that same line for both of you, how do you see AI playing a role in the church going forward? That could be anything from weekend services to mission trips to whatever yeah. comes to mind. Yeah, I mean a really easy one is just uh, you know, even just kind of the first time I came to Crossroads, it was sitting in the back and you were one, you were a person kind of trying to figure out where you fit into this, this massive thing. And so um, you kind of had to figure it out on your own. I know there's all kinds of services and people and connection events and all those kinds of things, but it was really on you to um, figure it out. 
I think there, I think AI presents a lot of opportunities to get people, uh, give them pathways to ask questions that they might feel dumb asking a real person. Um, it could craft lots of different um, messages that they that they need to hear in a more timely way, um, and really personalize your experience. So there's a lot in that, but I think that I think it could take you further and deeper quicker um, to get you connected to real people, but also to to different messages you need to need to hear. Churches have the the mandate to steward all of the resources before God. That means making as much happen with the offerings that we have, and it also means stewarding the spiritual experience of the people who are entrusted to your care, your church. And AI has to factor into both of those. If there are things that we can serve people better with, with AI, you both just gave a couple of great examples. I think that's wonderful. If there are, you know, the average church, the average, I wouldn't say the average, let's call it the... Uh, the gold standard benchmark, actually, the normal expectancy for a church is to spend 50% of their giving on on staffing. Uh, you can go underneath that, which is really great if you can, but you're also then bumping up against, you're probably not serving your people very well because they need real flesh interaction. You can go over 50%, but then you're going to be pinching other monies that could be going to missions or something else, right? So that's kind of thing. Well, if, if AI helps you reorient those staff jobs so there was more boots on the ground with actual people ministry, person-to-person people ministry, because there's maybe there's certain jobs that AI can do. Again, I think it's a stewardship thing. I think it's I think it's can be a great thing. Yeah, I think we're at the beginning of a new type of experience. Um, you know, I think for Crossroads specifically, worship, what you're seeing uh, behind you when you talk like all of the content you're creating, I think if you're putting a lot of effort into creating an experience for people to feel something. Right. And I think somewhere to, could you imagine a crossroads that doesn't have an app or isn't available to stream or didn't like, it just doesn't feel like the same thing. So I think we're like, what's the next, you know, kind of circle that we start to create where now we can create a new type of experience. And I think that, that there's so many exciting pathways that that can can you know can create from. They're now working on some children's books from the Five Marks for Man. Yeah. Instead of rehabbing older males and what a man is, being able to bring up the youngest generation with the story of what what a man is. And one of the things we're working on is you know a thing with a, a little kid and his dog Peanut, based on Peanut yeah. Peanut. Yeah. And we've given some proposals to some publishers and and all of the all the art. In the picture book, and another guy who's on our team, Seg, you know, he's he's worked on that. And the the publishers, we look at it like, what this is? A, who, who is this? Who is the, your illustrator? We can't find them. <laughs> it's not here because they want to hire the person yeah. to do some of their stuff. And we had to say, well, uh, it's AI. Yeah, it's AI. Now it wasn't like plug it and play, and you put two sentences of text, and there it is. You got to have someone who knows it. But yeah, yeah we uh, we did this and. A fraction of the time and a fraction of the budget, what you would pay somebody for, and it's great. 100%. Now, why would anybody argue with that? I don't understand why someone would argue with that. I mean, maybe the illustrator who wants to get paid to illustrate with crayons and pencils and paper, and the response, I think, of that person is, you can do that, and for you to not be a starving artist, you're going to have to figure out how to work with this AI. The yeah. same way that star- there are starving pastors who all they want to do is read a paper Bible and give people Bible studies. That's wonderful. Yep. But you're not going to be able to create a living that way. You're going to have to figure out some other more organizational savvy things to do to create scale. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just kind of like the impact that the Internet had on sharing knowledge around the world. And you had people who didn't have access to school or, you know, now you have access to information and knowledge. Like we're going to 10x that with AI. I mean, you know, just, I have an idea in my head and if I write it down on a piece of paper, I'm going to procrastinate. It's not going to happen. I got to go hire somebody. I got to, you can do it now in 10 seconds. And so it's just like, how quick can you get to that wow moment for you personally to get you motivated to then show it to somebody? And I think like you, you apply that to every single person in the world 
Um, I just think it's going to like unload this human potential of how we can actually, you know, get things done, um, at a scale that maybe we haven't seen yet. Um, you know, so the internet started it with just like, Hey, I'm craving new knowledge. And now with that knowledge, what can I do with it? And now we're going to see it at a fat, really rapid, faster pace than what happened with the internet. So the next 10 years are going to be insane. Uh, but I think it's going to happen, happen faster. We're going to see the, the impact a lot faster than the internet. Yeah. The biggest, the biggest fear that we got in all of these questions is, is AI going to take my job? Is right. Going to take my spot in the organization, whatever. And so Brian, what you're talking about, like more redeployment of people, yes. right? Um, what industries do you think are most prone to that maybe? And what can people do to like not be scared of it? Like how can I still embrace AI and learn to use it and not think it's coming from my job? I think the people who are listening to this podcast are going to be fine. We're going to be safe. You, you self-selected to be car, part of a community that's about the aggressive life. It's not the conservative life. It's not the keep life the way it has always been life. So if you're a person in your workforce who is driven to understand AI, make the applications for your personal job and for your business, you're not just going to be fine. You're going to make a lot more money. Mm, it's the people who say, I can't do this. You have to figure out what this means for you. It doesn't matter what your industry is, what your job is. You got to figure out how AI can impact, and you got to be the one that brings that to the organization. And if you do that, you're going to be invaluable and you will have no problems at all. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the I think what we're seeing is people that bring like bring our company into the organization are seen as a you know someone as a, as a hero of like how to yeah. help the organization save money, save time. So like one example was like everybody talks about creating around the cu the customer, the consumer. Like, hey, our organization's consumer obsessed, right? And so. Right. It's like, okay, well, what does that look like? Well, like, oh, we run surveys, we run focus groups. So, like, you know, we meet once a quarter to talk about, like, what we can create. Right. That's one way to do it. But what if you could actually talk with your customer every single minute, every single day, and everything you're creating, you're collaborating with them? Yeah. I think there's those types of opportunities. To your point, the people that are investing and curious about it are the ones that are building things that are going to be substantial for both their career, but also their companies. Um, so you have to be trying to uh, prototype different ways that you can use it in your life. Uh, data analysis is like kind of an, an easy one where you get some productivity gains, or if you're trying to generate visual, quick visuals or kind of the blank page problem, those are kind of easy ones. But I think it's less of a specific role and more of a some like a capability that you do every single day. Um, like we're always making things. We're always analyzing data. Um, we're always trying to come up with better ways to communicate it to one another. Yeah. And so these are just more fundamental kind of first principle types of things where AI can up your game in a really, really big way. Well, I'm curious with you too, Dirt. We've talked about this before. What, what, what have you heard from me about when I said, hey, we need to be using AI more, how did you internalize that? What were you freaked out about? What do you, what do you remember me saying to you? Yeah, I mean, I'm a... Because you're, you're on the front line. You should be on the front line of fear. Part of your job yeah, is totally. helping me write stuff. I'm a content well, what writer. If, yeah, yeah, what if I don't need you to write anything? Exactly. And that's that's where your mind goes first. You're like, well, we're just going to put this idea into chat or verve, and it's going to pump out a book, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I did have a lot of fear about it. And actually, the last conversation that you guys had really helped me get over a lot of that. I've been exploring it a lot more. I've been using it. It's a really great research tool. Mm -hmm. I spend hours researching guests, and I'm still going to read through it, right? I'm not just going to copy and paste, right. but I can go and say, what are the highlights about this person? What's a question I should ask Chad Reynolds about AI? And it literally gave me answers, right? And I go through, I pick the ones I like. I change it a little bit, but super time-saving, amazing research tool. I've yeah. used it to make images too, to help with content creation, you know, like what, what would this look like? What would it sound like? So Brian, I remember you saying AI is not going away, <laughs> right? You bury your head in the sand, but it's not going away. So we got to learn how to leverage it and make better work from it. And so 
what yeah. we're trying to do. And right. I tried to dive in, and it wasn't scary. I, like I use it every day almost now. Yeah. And I was one of the people that was like, uh uh-uh, uh, keep those robots away from me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the key things I think is uh, the, the kind of the human part of this is having taste. And so it's going to generate all different types of ideas, but it still needs you. A, to ask the question, and B, to have taste on like what you're going to curate and move forward. So I don't think any of those things are necessarily going away. I think it just enhances, you know, the like the humanity of it is like I'm going to, based off my brain and the context that I have, I know all the nuances. And I can now pick pick what, what, I, what I want to use if I have taste. Right, mm-hmm. right. I think one of the one of the highlights of the last conversation that you guys had, Chad, was hearing how you use it at bedtime to make it bedtime oh, yeah. stories for yeah. your daughter. Um, and so we had some questions, A, about how you both just use it in your normal lives. And then, Brian, specifically, how do you use it in crafting a sermon or like a weekend experience? So any practical applications of AI from both of you? I'm – the way I use it personally is I go to it for answers – when I just need answers instead of wanting information. I bought a my next vehicle to restore is going to be a 1953 Dodge Power Wagon that was used in World War II, that whole era of, of vehicles. And um, when the World War II ended, guys came back and they said, man, these were all people who had farms for the most part. We were still a, a highly agrarian culture. They said, that truck I had in Germany, you made for me, I'd love to have that on my farm. McDodge went, really? And they started kicking these fields out. So there's, there's different model years. And and what I was able to do going to chat GPT is I was able to say, what, as I look at these to buy one of these things used and are broken down and rusted out, can you give me, what? what's the difference in the different model years? And it just kicked out all this. This year has this. Year has that. And here, that. it was just there. It was done. I, I just couldn't have gotten anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. So it's really helped helped that for me. And I, yeah, it was really great for my job. I'm not using it too much for my job. This is where I'm a, I'm a weird one because uh, we have a big enough organization. I have other people have to learn how to use it for their job. If I was just starting out Crossroads and I had a skeletal staff of three or four people. I would be learning how to master ChatGPT for sermon research. I'd probably go into AIA and have them do what a staff member is doing right now for me and say, hey, look, Bo, I, I live week to week. I'm not one of these guys. I heard a preacher yesterday on a podcast say he's, you know, he's three weeks out. So he's got people who are looking at his manuscript basically three weeks before he gives his next one. Mm-hmm. And he's got – I'm not that. I am – I wake up on Monday morning after having preached, and I and I say, God, what, what what do you want for your people? Where am I? Where's my heart? What is that? I start for I fresh, fresh every Monday morning, and I have a person who feeds me ideas so that when I get up Monday morning and look at the document, I don't feel like I'm on my own. I feel like oh, there's stuff here I can work with. I normally probably only use ten percent of it, but I feel like I'm not naked, right? Yeah. Uh, that person is using AI and giving me some stuff. Well, if I didn't, we couldn't afford to pay that person. That's not the only thing to do with their job. If I couldn't afford to do that, then I would, I'd be master of the chat GPT, right. man. Just, just figure out how to program that in. Give them your sermon stuff, your, your, your things coming in and have them generate for you just a document of stuff. Yeah. I mean, so I'm probably, I don't know, maybe a little bit more specific about what we're, what I'm creating around me, uh, based off where I want to save time. So, um, well, I'd say like some are, some are saving time. Some are like giving me creative collaborators, if you will. So I'm creating AI agents, um, like in our app that are, you know, one specifically for like the bedtime story, right? So it's kind of trained off of that. One is a, uh, like a sales, a sales agent that's trained on our product and how we're trying to market it. And I can ask it, E- you know, as we get emails of like, "Hey, how are you different than ChatGPT?" It's generating answers for me based off all the data it, it knows about about what we're doing and, and everything. So I can save time and say, "Hey, here specifically, it's not like my lens; it's like literally how we're different." Um, I'm also, you know, just building agents that are helping take ideas in a completely new direction. So give me 
a completely different take than the way I would see it. So I have different agents like that. We, we created generational agents. So I can ask now Jenny Z to see how a Gen Zer might apply, like apply this idea in their world, how we have Boomer, like to see how a Boomer might respond. And it's just really interesting to be able to collaborate uh, with different AIs um, around a topic that you're, that you're working in to get different perspectives. And then again, it comes down to taste of like, how am I going to take something from here, 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 and create something new from it? Yeah. So we want, we want people to play with Verve, right? Yeah. So how, can you give us like the 30,000 foot view? How's it different from chat? How would somebody listening to this, like, can they, can they download the app? Yeah. No? Yeah. You can download the app. Um, so we're somewhat competitive to like a chat GBT. Um, they are actually one of the LLMs in our platform. So you can pick, you know, you can pick them, you can pick Claude, you can pick Google Gemini um, to collaborate with. But yeah, we're, we're much more focused on kind of businesses. So enterprises that want to use AI to create new products, new ideas, new innovation. Um, that's primarily our target. So you can download it, you can create an account, but we've been toying around with uh, a lot of these use cases that we're hearing about of like the, the children's book, you know, this was something we just created, you know, I just created in 10 minutes, but it's, you know, it's kind of like caught on. I've got like other, other people who want to kind of emulate and have that same solution. You know, we now, because of our what we've built, we can create an unlimited amount of AI agents. So you can create a, you know, a specific agent trained off a type of Jeep, and it's it's with you in the trenches to like help bring you parts, bring you ideas. It's it's like the FAQ or the manual or the internet just in that world of of a Jeep. There's so many different types of applications we can build on top of that, because at the end of the day, those are really just kind of a wrapper around like an agent. So launching the children's book, um, maybe you pick from all different types of authors and then you can generate this in seconds for you. Well, I just thought to myself, I've got that Jeep that I have rebuilt mm -hmm. and it's not done because it's not running right. I've, only, I've got two or three cylinders that just are not firing and I have a crack mechanic, old school mechanic who's, who's given me dozens of hours and just can't figure it out. We replaced every part, just gone over things. I'm, I'm at my wit's end. I just thought, hmm, I wonder if I could just start a conversation with chat GPT and see if they can roost anything up. Cause you can keep refining it, right? You probably yeah. 304 CJ seven VOA roll on the, they're going to spit me off. So I'll say I did all that, but it has a, MSD box on it, and they might stick. Okay, I put the rev limiter to five five. That doesn't do it. They'll probably just keep giving me ideas to refine right. itself, right? Yeah. Oh, I gotta do that. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> wouldn't that, I tell you what? Seriously, if that happens, we're gonna come back and talk about this because Heck if yeah. that's the no, thing, it's easy. We can do it. Like we could do it right now. Gosh. I mean, so wow, that's, I mean, that'd be a perfect example for that because I have the best there is right. figuring this out. Yeah. Like the only guy left in all of Cincinnati is probably a bit of. Hyperbole, but I couldn't find anybody else who knows how to build a rebuild a carburetor. No right. one knows how to do it anymore. Right. Change a carburetor, put it in an electronic fuel ignition, but he knows stuff that people don't know because he's eighty some. He's been doing this forever. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, that's that's where AI excels is taking knowledge, putting it in a container, and now putting a conversational UI like an interface over top of it, and now you can talk to it. Mm. And so you know, it's a it's a matter of how do you get the data in. So. You know, ChatGPT essentially is trained off the internet. So it went out to grab all the data on the internet that it had, quote unquote, publicly available. And so it used all that as training data to create their, you know, their network, their model. Um, same thing with Google, same thing with Anthropic, same with a bunch of different open source models, right? So when you're using ChatGPT, you're using that LLM, their model. And you're going to get fundamentally different answers when you ask Google's model when you ask Anthropic's model or when you ask like Verve's model. So you'll get different kinds of responses based off of what it knows. The cool thing is that you could create your own essentially model trained and fine tuned off of what this one person knows with all the knowledge from the internet too. And so you put that into an app and now you can start to talk with your car, right? So 
talk with the knowledge, get all these things. And as you're you know, having conversations with it, it starts to build a memory because it's getting now new knowledge from what you're giving it or maybe thousands of people who are asking questions too. It's starting to build its own specific knowledge base around that topic. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what is so cool is that you know, these are things that may not live on the internet or have lived on the internet, but now they can live within an AI that you can start to talk with. Mm-hmm. And it can be you know, anonymized, so it's not You know, it's pulling from a data source, but it doesn't necessarily have to give your name or it's not like a post you made or a comment you made. It can be just pulled, you know, pulled from that. Well, that's a good question. What where do you think things stand with AI stealing somebody else's work and words? Yeah. So there are a lot of lawsuits currently, you know, across a lot of the big AI platforms of where specifically they got their data. So a lot of those are pending um, and going through different things, you also have companies like ChatGPT or OpenAI signing data deals with publishers. So, because they want the rights to everything, that makes sense, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then it, now it's like, well, where did you get your data in the first place? So, are some of these deals that you're signing are they retroactive? Of like, hey, we already took your took your data, <laughs> and, right? Um, so, there's a lot of gray area around where people got their data in the first place to train their model. Um, but yeah, now they're signing deals where they now get exclusive access to, you know, the, the articles from this one publication or, um, you know, like, uh, a, a platform like, um, Reddit, you know, Reddit has now taken all of their data, uh, and packaged it up. So now you can pay to, to get access to it and use it to power an AI application. So um, I think everybody's getting hip to that the power of AI is really in the data. Um, And if you own data, you own quality data, you now have a leg up on the person next to you. But ChatGPT, OpenAI, if someone types in a query on uh, just um, I call it uh, masculine Christianity, say, Mm -hmm. yep, are they? allowed to comb through articles I've written that are on my website and make that part of their background? Uh, it depends what you mean by allowed. Like part of this is that it's not necessarily doing like a real time search, you know, like, like a, a Google page gets web crawled and then it, it's taking you to kind of like a real time data. Right. A lot of the stuff was, uh, getting a snapshot of that data maybe six months ago and then may have used it as training uh, for powering its responses back. So um, I think each each website is unique in their uh, terms and conditions, pro- privacy policy. You can specifically out- outlaw the use of your content to use for scraping. Uh, mm. And so it's up to each, essentially up to each yeah. website owner of do you want this used for training or not? Yeah. If someone if someone got paid to write an article for the New York Times and the New York Times is getting paid by people who have subscriptions, there's no way you can just go in there and take all that content because someone actually owns that and that that was the that was the rules of the games from day one. But for someone like me, who just wants as many people to read their stuff as possible and stuff isn't gated, I don't know I don't know what the argument would be that they so, can't just take my stuff because I'm offering it up for free anyway to anybody yeah. who gets there. Well, so then if I f- pull this thread, yeah, so do. if I take all of the words that were in your book, if I took a bunch of your articles and I put it into an app that I launched called BTAI, and now anybody, I'm charging right. you know, a subscription fee, and now anybody can talk to BT. But you, and you're not getting compensated for that. Okay, okay. Well, that's, yeah. I, you, well, this, you couldn't do it with a book because that was a closed system that someone paid for, so I would take that out. But like on my web page... I mean, under what I'm putting out there is a possible solution to it. But if you said BT masculinity and you're going to interact with me, but then you're you're using my likeness. You're not using my words that I put out there for anyone to have for free. You're 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 tricking people. You're taking my identity. Yeah. But you're saying all oh, this is not figured out yet. We're, we're having a little debate. We're saying, <laughs> well, this should be and this should be. But you're saying there's no not, governing rules that have they're moderating this yet. Correct. Okay. Some of the yeah, some of the legislation that's currently in in California is 
addressing some of those things okay. because it, it – Well, Californians will get it right. Yeah. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> um, yeah, but there's currently lawsuits you know, fundamentally Actually, around – it's interesting. You probably, California probably is the right place for that to be. You know, there's a lot right. of people who would disagree with the – with the direction of the of the state holistically, but man, when it comes to personal freedom, personal expression, looking out for the little guy, what's well, also that's home, kind of their, it's also the home state of like OpenAI and a bunch of these tech companies. So right. yes, they they were ahead of the curve on consumer policies and all kinds of things around it. But yeah, I mean, some of these things aren't necessarily quote unquote figured out. I think they're it just comes down to ethics and then as these rules and legislation gets spun up you, what do you do with the retroactive things um, it's just like when you would ask an AI certain questions the cutoff date of their knowledge might have been six months ago so you can't ask like current events necessarily around it so you'll start to see those a little bit more and more of some of the gaps of what you can do with it based off of what data they have access to interesting yeah, yeah so Kind of related question, the funding for AI development, is that all private? Is any of that funding government? And then attached to that question is, if it's government funded, should I be worried about censorship or certain answers not showing up or? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say in the, like in the beginning years, a lot of the funding was private, you know, private in investors and VCs. You wanted to explore what this was. A lot of the challenges that happen through AI or open AI as an organization originate from their founding as a nonprofit to create a more responsible kind of rules and regulations around AI. And then they became profitable, right? They're for profit. So it's like, okay, well, this is strange how this has kind of happened. Um, and so, you know, they're now, you know, a commercial company. They want to make money. They're also signing deals uh, with, you know, like the U.S. government. And so there's lots of different things of, you know, what could unfold from that. Um, and I think it's, it's just too early to tell what that actually looks like. Yeah. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should be at least simple. That's why for the last two years, I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions, at home, on a hunting trip, camping off my motorcycle, no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to get moving. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. I like to have it in the morning. I have a 12 ounce of water, so right off the bat, I'm, I'm helping my hydration every single morning. This is the one product, if I had to recommend one, I'd recommend this one to elevate your health. It's AG1, and that's why I partnered with them for two years. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash aggressive life. That's drinkag one dot com slash aggressive life get yourself some i just got a new grill slash smoker and out of all the meat i'm cooking up there's something that hits the spot like no other a real american cheeseburger and when I got to buy burger, man, I want Flying K Ranch. Located in Findlay, Ohio, Flying K Ranch raises their beef the natural way. No hormones or antibiotics, just happy cows eating grass all day. Flying K is a family business that ships all over America and partners with state and national certification boards to make sure cattle and customers are happy. Learn more and place your orders at flyingkranchangus.com. That's flyingkranchangus.com. Time to eat and time to get back to the show. BT, one of the things that we talk about on this podcast a lot is the state of men, right? And one of the things that's not going so great is loneliness. Yeah. 
how do we ensure that the rise of AI does not contribute to loneliness, right? Well, it, I mean, we've been talking about having a chat with a Jeep, having a chat with a Gen Z person, but what about, will it eventually take the place of face-to-face conversations, or how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Well, I think it's definitely going to take the place of a lot of face-to-face conversations. It's already happening right now. When's the last time you called someone to get some ideas on your home project? You don't do that anymore. You go to you go to YouTube. That's right. I mean, I, I do it. Yeah. You go to YouTube University yeah. and ask, blah, 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 and, and, and it pops out. So it already is decreasing that. So it's only going to decrease it more. Yeah. Same with, uh, it's, it's weird. I don't know if you feel this way, but when somebody calls you on the phone, you're like, hey, is something wrong? <laughs> right. Right. Why didn't you text me? <laughs> right. Yeah. And so I think yeah. we're being, we've yeah, been sure. conditioned you know, over the last decade that if you want to reach me, text me. Hmm. Um, if something's wrong, call me. And so I think we're making a lot of these real-time decisions, whether we know it or not, of like, hey, here's what I want to accomplish. Should I email Brian? Should I text him? Should I call him? Uh, should I stop by his house? Should I like? Should I go through another person to get to, like? We're already making all these different types of decisions, but one of the biggest ones is that now everybody's conditioned to just like give an emoji of how they're feeling or texting, you know, to get to communicate. And so this is only going to go further down that. And I think that we need to, as a society, we need to start creating more social AI types of experiences um, that are still bringing people together. It's not just, you know, another feature that is going to enhance. Social AI experiences. Explain that. So I think there's a, maybe a trap you fall into where AI, the first interface for AI has been a, a conversation, like a text, you know, like a chat interface, right? And it was primarily about like, okay, I took all this data, I turned it into numbers, I put it in this container, and then how do people interact with it? Because it's no longer a spreadsheet, it's no longer a, a book. And so they put a chat interface over top of it so that you know you know how to ask questions and then the AI can essentially give you answers in yeah. more conversational language. Right. Um, I think the next step in some AI uh, you, you know, user interfaces are, well, what if it goes beyond just a, a chat interface? What if it's delivering you know, imagery to you? What if it's uh, creating sounds? What if it's introducing you to people? What if it is a part of a building? So I know we talked about it kind of early in the early days. Like, well, what if I could walk into Crossroads and it knew I was there? It knew what I was hearing. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's the experience that it could give me both with other people that might be in the same spot as me? Can it connect us? Can it like, what are th- like, what are the possibilities? And so I think we're in, like I said, the early, early days of what AI is, which is like kind of talking with people that aren't there. Now it's like, how do I get introduced to people that I didn't know are going through the same thing that I'm going through and do so it in a more walk private way. into a crossroads or a, a church, a restaurant, a, a whatever, and you're yeah. saying there's readers, I, I'm, I'm saying this probably could happen, there's readers that scan your phone and see what you're dealing with and who you are, and if you check off the box, I'd like to meet someone here on my date, and somebody else walks through there, Correct. and they're scanning their feed, and they've also checked off, I'd like to meet someone here I can date. It kind of sends a text to both of you and says, hey, Bo's here. Yeah, you might be worth a uh, thirty-second conversation. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that, that, that thanks for that cool. example. But, I yeah. cool. Did I just but, yeah. invent that example, or did somebody no, no, else? No, no, I mean, it's, no. I mean, it's what we talked that's about. That's your new business, man. No, I mean, let's. We're working towards that. Oh, like, you are. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, so I mean, that was like, this has kind of always been the dream. Is that Dude, that'd be great? Uh, you know, each of us have our knowledge, our experience, the things we're going yeah. through. Our interface I tell is you our, what that that is someone's next billion dollar business. Yeah. It's the next level dating app because you don't know if someone's being honest in whatever dating app that is. You have, right. you have no idea. No. But if the AI is going, oh, this person legit- legitimately looking through their emails, the apps they have, this person has a spiritual bow in their body for Jesus. Correct. And this person genuinely has that. I wish they... I wish they knew each other. Yeah, right. right. Yes. And so that's, that's... And how much would you pay for that date? 
Uh, I mean, seriously. No, I know. I know. Have a finally culminated, uh, what's the word I'm looking filtered date, uh, pre, pre-screened pre date? Yeah, I mean, you go so much deeper. I mean, it's when I met Nicole, like, we just went from zero to 100, like, very fast because, but it was all somewhat left to chance. Like, we ended up being at the same spot at the same time, the same, like, but, and that's why it, like, moves so fast. But for everybody else... I mean, it took took you like thirty six years to find <laughs> to find that, and it we all have the knowledge. The data is like stuck in us. Our interface is our mouth, our fingers to like type things or like, how, like how how do I get discovered? And so, I think the new the new world of AI is introducing new interfaces to the data. Right, so the data exists, and if you walk into a crossroads building, I know you would love to have. You know, have it on your iPad to be like, okay, here is what people are struggling with. Here are the connective tissue. Here's some of the things that maybe I didn't plan to talk about, but like, you know, you want to have impact. And so that's the opportunity that we have in front of us. And so, yes, you can be scared about, about what it is, or you can run towards this of like, how do I get people to be more social and connected? And it's really just that we've put all these barriers up around all of us, whether we exist as different people on Facebook versus LinkedIn or like all these, these are artificial boundaries. How else should the average person just be doing this? Like it's a smart thing to do. I've given some examples from my occupation, but what else? I guess it's just a smart thing to do to have a calendar on your smartphone that syncs with your your computer and can send you notes. It's just a smart thing to do. Right. What are the other like no brainer things that you probably should just do this? Just do this. We would be helped with it as it relates to AI. Um, I mean, I mean, I think I think getting a paid version of AI. You know, like we're primarily just focused on enterprise right now, but we're going to launch you know like a consumer grade uh, type of product. You know, compete with a uh, ChatGPT or you know, Claude. Um, so I think getting, you know, make, if you are using AI, just getting a pro version to make sure your data is safe. Um, and then I, I would just look at different, uh, different things you do through the day, through the week, through your month that you feel are barriers of like, Hey, I haven't been able to break through here, or I've had this idea forever and I've, it's stalled. Uh, I would just try to find things like that. Um, because you're already, or you're already excited about them. You just don't necessarily have an outlet for it just yet. So yes to the kind of integrations of getting, you know, getting that there, but I would move that app, not from your laptop, but move it to your phone. And so, because right. at nighttime, um, you know, I'm finding myself like I, it used to be shut off, shut off your brain at like 11 and then like maybe watch something on Netflix. Right. Then I started to go to, well, what if I watched Spotify, which I know sounds super weird, but I put, I have Spotify on my TV and I'm watching podcasts on Spotify. I've kind of like moved into this. Because? I wanted business content or like, uh, I don't know, I just wanted a different kind of content. There's, there's like content of, you know, hey, I just want to disappear. Just like watch a funny movie or watch a funny show. Then there's sometimes where it's like I want to go into like deep, deep thinking around like this topic, and so I started, you know, just watching YouTube on the TV or watching Spotify podcasts. Um, now I'm starting to use my phone and have conversations with agents around ideas and that I'm trying to articulate or trying to explore. Um, okay. And it's it's kind of a new behavior, but it's on my phone, and I think that's going to be the big unlock for AI. Is it it's 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 a personal device i'm treating as a personal device and then i'm i'm hoping it helps me take take me personally further based off anything that i'm doing yeah last question cuz we've been going for an hour have we really yeah almost but look how exciting you I are know. <laughs> you're okay. exciting and excited yes you are yeah. yeah i love that we got a lot of questions about people or from people about how to implement ai with their faith they're not against each other so how can I use it to help grow my faith or deepen my relationship yeah. with God? Like a like a lot of those. So I love you know we're not scared. We're not starting from a place of fear. And once we got past that, how can we use it positively? Any ideas from either of you? Yeah, I mean I've been using it for a while now to build out. You know whether you're in a small group or you're you're on your own. 
um, you know, use it in a way where you can ask questions of like, hey, I'm struggling with you know, this topic. Um, put together a week devotional for me around you know, using the book of James. Right. And so give me a verse each day. Give me an activity I can do. You know, give me homework. And it literally built out a plan for me in three seconds. Um, it, I'd go the next week. Um, so in like our small group, if BT didn't show up, we're like, hey, what, are, what, are you, what are, was everybody going through? I'm like, hey, how do, we, how do we talk about entrepreneurship and, you know, around like today? And so, again, I asked Verve to generate this for me. And it pulled out, it pulled out all the verses. It pulled out our activity, which should be our discussion today. It did it in three seconds. And so those are just real practical ways that you can prep for your week or even just in the moment where you meet somebody on a plane or meet and you're like, how do I talk to them about this topic? I can go to AI and, and solve that problem in seconds. It's then up to you what you do with it. But man, what a, what a starting point. Yeah. Right. So is there anything about the topic that you guys want to talk about a question you wish you were asked? We always end with that. Yeah, I thought we were going to go more into like AI girlfriends and, <laughs> and all those topics, but well, I think we covered that. Did we cover that last time? We did. We yeah. did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. yeah, that's dangerous, man. I know. <clears throat> I, I mean, know. it's really dangerous to even to mention it. I, I like people would just not even know that existed. I just talked on sex last week, and as you know, as you know, I brought it up, and I shudder to think that I've turned people into something that they didn't know about, and now they're going to go down a unhealthy sexual well for for some time. Yeah, I mean, I, if that happens, all your fault because you turned me <laughs> because you turned me on to it, I and I turned so. others on to it. Yeah, well, it's your fault. <laughs> not, not true. So you thought we were going to talk AI girlfriends? What were we going to say about AI girlfriends or boyfriends? No, no, no. no. I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure where this was going to go because uh, there's so many different applications for it, and uh, you know, I think uh, I think the starting point is fear for any anything new, right? So I think we're going to talk through some of that. Um, it's just in the really interesting use cases where I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of learning and, and still exploring, you know, things like that. So I know that was one where we you know, kind of brought it up around male loneliness that, yeah, there are, you know, products out there that are trying to take advantage of, of what that is, uh, companionship. And so they're doing it in lots of different ways and different resolutions of how real it feels and, and yeah, it's scary. It's scary. Um, and I think that, you know, those have always been some of the areas that, you know, technology is kind of innovated fast because there's a lot of money and a lot of people who are craving those things. But there's also this whole other side of, well, yeah, but then we, how do we use it to improve humanity? How do we use it to improve what I'm capable of? How do I take God's message and give it to me in a language I can understand? Like, those are some amazing use cases on the potential that we're looking at. Yeah, I, 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 an unusual close for today because I'd normally give some really big fired up thing of, hey, here's what you need to do and apply something, put this into action. And I don't, I don't really know what the actual application is today. I just do know that there's too few level-headed, educated discussions happening around this topic and content like this in general. And so, Bo, thanks so much for spending two episodes with us to try to bring us up to speed and we can all make our own decision where to go from here. But this is not going away and we need to be on the, uh, on the attack and try to figure out a way to use it positively or on the attack and try to put up some defenses that doesn't come to hurt us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're a blessing. Thanks. Hey, we'll see you next time on The Aggressive Life. Thanks for joining us on this journey toward aggressive living. Find more resources, articles, past episodes, and live events over at bryantome.com. My new books, a repackaged edition of The Five Marks of a Man and a brand new Five Marks of a Man tactical guide are open right now on Amazon. If you haven't yet, leave this podcast a rating and review. It really helps get the show in front of new listeners. And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram at Brian Tome. The Aggressive Life is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.